today I'll be talking about pre-Christian Celtic society. Now some of you might ask, why learn about Celtic culture? What does it matter in, you know, the modern world? Well, the Celts as a people have a humongous historical relevancy in the modern world, the modern Western society. Without them, basically all of history would have been different. Now you could say this about any people, but I would say especially so with the Celtic people. To give one example of the historical relevancy of the Celts, we'll just say Roman equipment. Basically, almost every major part of Roman equipment is inspired or influenced or stolen directly from the Celts. Take their chainmail, which they would call Lorica Hamata in Latin, in classical Latin. It was invented by the Celts straight up. If you look back in the historical records, or rather the archaeological records, you'll find that the Celtic peoples were using chain mail almost exactly the same as that used by the Roman Republic, the late Roman Republic legionnaires way before the Romans did. The, their shields, the scutum in Latin. Well, first off, the word scutum probably comes from the Celtic sceton meaning shield. Not only that, but both of them were large oval shields that covered over half the body. It seems pretty much the same to me, does it not? Uh, there are swords, the gladius. Gladius comes from Gaulish gladios, meaning sword. The gladius comes from a basically an Iron Age revamp of an old Bronze Age design of stabbing swords developed by the Celts in the Alps, the pre-Celtic Hallstatt and Latin peoples. So, without all of these equipment, it, it might not have been possible that the Romans would have invented these themselves and rose to the prominence that they did. Even if they adopted Greek and Etruscan technology and warfare techniques, it is still possible that they never would have defeated the Carthaginians. If this was the case, then, well, Carthage, not Rome, would be the dominant power of the Western Mediterranean. And if this was the case, well, all of history would change. The Celts have a substantial influence on history. Even if you look at the history of the United States of America, for example, or even the United Kingdom, the British Empire, well, the English people are up to 60% Celtic by blood. So, that means without those Celtic peoples, the British people wouldn't exist. Without the British people, well, the world as we know it would be completely different due to how much the British Empire has impacted the modern world. Another fine point on how important the Celtic peoples are is just how many peoples are partially descended from or partially or fully descended from. For example, the Irish people, which is the most widely known of the Celtic peoples, is has one of the largest diasporas of any people on earth. There is way, way more Irish people in America alone than there are in Ireland. And as I mentioned previously, the English are part Celtic because the Anglo-Saxon invaders intermarried with Celtic wives many, many times over throughout the centuries. The Germans are part Celtic, especially in the south where the Alpine Celtic peoples once were. In fact, if we want to say that the French and German component in 23andMe's ancestry is considered Celtic, then the Swiss are almost 70% Celtic. And uh, the French, of course, are about 25% Celtic from the Gaulish people. Now, don't take all these percents as set in stone. They vary from person to person and region to region. The uh, people of Iberia, that is Spain and Portugal, they are definitely part Celtic, far less than the other regions mentioned, but definitely part Celtic. In fact, even though they don't have much in Celtic blood, Celtic history and culture is very prominent there because the Celtic societies that lived in pre-Roman Iberia were heavily influenced by the Celts in both language, culture, and material culture such as weapons and art.
Celtic society, like many at the time, was hierarchical, with kings at the top, druids and warriors below, and artisans at the bottom. For those of you who have merely heard of the druids, and don't quite know what their function was, the druids acted as the priestly and scholarly class of Celtic society. The druids would remember the stories of old, passing them down from one generation to the next through word of mouth alone. As the case with many oral traditions, the druids would learn a story by heart until they could not forget it, so that that story may live on through them, no matter it be about god or hero. Despite the common image of a druid wearing white robes, with a crown of leaves, perhaps a sickle in one hand, and a long white beard, not much is known about the druid's physical appearance. In fact, the idea of them having white robes could be a mistranslation of a Latin text in which it says that they have white clothes, but many mistranslate this word for robes. So it is likely, like most Celts, they wore a tunic of some kind, perhaps a white one as suggested in the text. Others have speculated that they wore cloaks made of grey bull's hide. A crown found in a burial in England may suggest that the druids wore crowns made of bronze or copper. Also very similar to such political entities as the Holy Roman Empire, the ancient Celts would have perhaps a high king of the various regions combined to make a tribe, and each separate region within the tribe, which could have minor tribes, would have their tribal chieftains or minor kings, and of course Below them, you'd have the entire hierarchy, so it was almost a pyramid made of pyramids. Warfare is a complex subject when discussing the Celts. There are many contradictions in historical sources. And just like the Romans, who believed themselves to be the heirs to Mars, and great Trojan war heroes that fled during the Aeneid, the Celts had a very strong religious tie with their view of warfare as well. The Celts were generally known throughout the ancient world as great soldiers. Before they were conquered by Rome, they were used as mercenaries for the Carthaginians, the Romans, and the Greeks, and even the Egyptians. The Gauls were said to have amazing cavalry. The Britons had the best chariot warriors. And Celtiberians had great heavy infantry, as well as Gauls and, well, all the rest. Since the Celts were not a unified fighting force, they tended to fight each other as well. Prime example of this were the Irish raids on the Welsh and the Britons around 600 AD, as well as the wars between the Arverni and Aedui in Gaul. The Celts were of course also known for their great innovations in weaponry and armor. Celtic swords were among the largest at their time, and were some of the first to perfect both bronze and iron. The Celts originally used bronze chest plates as their main form of armor, but would soon switch to chainmail, an invention of their own, which would suit them well in fighting Romans, and would survive all the way till medieval times. And the standard form of Gallic helmets during the late period would be adopted by the Romans, which would eventually become, you guessed it, the Roman Gallic helmet. Now let me mention the elephant in the room, and that is naked Celts. In many depictions of them in media and pop culture, Celts fight naked. Now this is due to some Roman authors saying so, as well as ancient Greek and Roman statues of Gaul, such as the Dying Gaul, one of the most famous still surviving statues of a Celt from antiquity. Now, of course, this could be, in fact, true that some Celts did fight naked. After all, why would there be so many depictions of such? It could also be argued that's why they have such large shields to protect their bodies. This could also be choked up to the Romans and the Greeks trying to depict how barbaric they believe the Celts to be. 
Personally, I believe it's somewhere in between these two options. It's likely that some of the poorer Celts, what you'd call the Ambachtos, the servants, probably did fight naked, but probably way fewer than actually is depicted. After all, northern France and Britain are cold places. They probably have some clothes on, regardless if they wanted to be protected or not. When Celts fought amongst each other, however, there was a special kind of battle that might happen. In these battles, both sides would have their champion come out and insult each other, and boast about their great deeds and those of their ancestors. And then, the two champions would have a duel, and whoever gave up or died first was the loser, and thereby their entire side lost. In this way, both tribes would suffer minimal casualties. The ancient Celts had far more women's rights than ancient Rome or Greece did. Unlike Rome, where a wife was the property of her husband, marriages to the ancient Celts were a partnership, as they are today. And though most women were housewives, as in other cultures, some were great warriors or even queens, such as Queen Baudica of the Iseni tribe, Cartamandua of the Brigantes, both of which are in England, and Queen Maeve, the possibly historical Irish queen. Well, now we come to the final part of the culture of the ancient Celts, and uh, that would be religion. And this is, of course, the most complex subject and most controversial, as very little is actually known about the religion of the ancient Celts, most of which we can only reconstruct from Roman sources, archaeological sources, and reconstructionism from very little is known about the gods of the ancient Celts, mostly because through most of their history they didn't carve them or make them into statues, until the Romans and Greeks introduced this idea. For instance, when the Gauls under Brennus and Bolgios invaded Delphi, Greece, in about 300 BC, they saw the statues of the ancient Greek gods and scoffed, and this is because they said that the gods were beyond physical representation, so why make statues of them? Of course, their descendants would make statues of their gods, but this was after Greek influence. We do know, however, that the boar was a very important symbol to the ancient Celts, as it represented raw strength. It was considered a symbol of the warriors. It could be seen on Gallic standards and Pictish runestones, or to be more correct, Oyam stones. The representations of gods that we do have, however, are still tricky. This is because they're hard to identify, and many divine names seem to be epithets of their actual names, such as Tautatis, which means the god of the tribe. This could refer to literally any of the gods, as long as the tribe worships that particular god as their main god. One god that we do know something about is Taranis, or in Celtic, Toranos, literally the Thunderer. He is the Gallic equivalent of Thor, which means we already know a thing or two about him due to Indo-European Reconstructionism. He is likely a protector of humanity from evil demons and spirits, using his lightning bolts to destroy them. And thunder is the sound of his horse's hooves beating against the ground. Many statues of him have been found, most of which are labeled as Jupiter Toranus or Latin for Jupiter Toranus. This is an example of Interpretatio Romana which is a process by which Romans compare foreign gods to their own, and thereby think of those foreign gods as one and the same with their own. One of the ways we can tell traditional Jupiter statues apart from Jupiter Toranos is that Toranos rides a horse in many statues, something that a Jupiter never does. Toranos also tends to hold a wheel or have armor the on. The wheel possibly being a solar symbol, 
or possibly a symbol representing the rolling thunder, perhaps of a chariot, his armor representing how he goes to war with the demons and evil gods, which are known as boogies in Celtic. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's where we get the term boogeyman. Lugus is an especially interesting god for many reasons. First off, he has many places named after him, such as the modern French city of Lyon, which comes from Lugodunum, the fort of Lug. He is also of mysterious origin, however, as even though his name appears to mean white or shining, it can't be proven using etymology, and it's difficult to tell what he is the god of. People have made various suggestions, from being a moon god, a sun god, a sky god, a storm god, but the most plausible thus far is a god of the arts, or perhaps a god of death. People have also made various connections between him and the Norse god Odin, since he appears with wolves and ravens, and sometimes even with one eye. Not only that, but his main weapon is a spear in the few times that he is depicted with one. The main difference between the two is that Lug is always depicted as young, while Odin as old. Even after Christianization, Lug still was popular, and became the Irish Lu and the Welsh Llew, both of which were popular characters in both respective countries' folklore despite the stories they're being part of being very different from each other. One god who's in a bit of an enigma is Kernunos. He's only known by that name from one inscription, and it's uncertain if that's the god's actual name. He's a god often depicted with the features of a deer, either antlers, doe ears, or perhaps even hooves. In most depictions, he holds in one hand a snake with a ram's head, and in another a bag of coins or a torque, which is a golden Celtic necklace. Sometimes, rather than the snake being in his hand, it's wrapped around his gut like a belt. Which is oddly similar to a later Irish story about the cousin of Cuchulain, Conal Cairnoch, who just so happens to also have a very similar sounding name to Cairnunos. In the story, he is faced against a giant snake, but the snake decides to become his belt rather than actually fighting him. Even though most neo-pagans tend to worship Karnunos as a god of nature, many modern scholars believe him to be a god of death, or perhaps the crossroads, due to the fact that he is in between man and beast, and in one hand he holds a snake, a symbol of chaos, and in another, gold, a symbol of order. And of course, there are many, many other Celtic gods, and I barely scratched the surface on the ones I did talk about, so I will save them for another day. The culture of the Celts is a vast subject, and I couldn't possibly cover it all in one video. So I'm going to make a part two to this video, where I'll further expand upon Celtic religion, and how all the aspects of Celtic culture developed later on in Irish, Scottish, and Welsh culture, possibly Breton and even Galicia, and influenced other cultures such as English, German, and French. Well, until then, Dagos Noctos, Pewaletis, and if you'll excuse me, I have to go slay some Romans.